morning, and thank you for tuning into my presentation titled Equal Compliance Policy Enhancement. As uh, Sherilyn stated, my name is Heather. In my traditional Haudenosaunee community, I am known as Gasa Knight, um, which means name laying down. Um, I am honored to be able to share my, re my action research project with you. First, I'm going to start with a disclaimer. In this presentation, I will be using the term Indian as it is the term that is used in the federal statute. However, American Indian and or Native American is generally more preferred. ICWA is a federal legislation that affords Native children, tribal nations, and Native families certain protections to maintain family and cultural connections when removed from the home and are placed in a foster care. The Indian Child Welfare Act was passed in 1979 due to the high rate of Indian children being removed from their homes and communities. As the director of the Bureau of Native American Services for OCFS, I am responsible for a variety of issues, such as continuing to honor the historical treaties made with the nations in New York State and acting as the tribal liaison around social service issues. And lastly, and most importantly, ensuring New York State's compliance with the Indian Child Welfare Act. I selected this project to assist in improving New York State's compliance to ICWA and to ensure New York State's practice meets all of the mandated areas of ICWA, which includes qualified expert witness, active efforts, notification, and placement preferences. Before ICWA was passed, the Association for American Indians conducted a nationwide study. This study surveyed the, so the state social service departments, juvenile prob probation facilities, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. At this time, the BIA had the authority to place children into care, foster homes, or residential boarding schools. What they found were that large states had anywhere from 25 to 35% of Indian children separated from their families. They were able to determine American Indian children were more likely to experience out-of-home placement than non-Indian children. This displacement rate still exists in some part of the country today. They found that the reasoning for out-of-home placements were extreme poverty, prejudice, discrimination, and cultural misunderstanding. The Association of American Indian Affairs conducted subsequent studies in 1974 and 1976 and found similar disparities. It is important to know that the spirit and intent of ICWA is to keep children from being removed unnecessarily and to keep them connected to, to their families and tribal nations. While compliance is mandatory, there are certainly barriers to reaching it. One barrier is identification, or I shall say a lack of identification. If a child is not identified as an Indian at the, initi at the initiation of the child welfare case, it creates issues along the way, especially in adoption cases, as I have seen cases where identification were brought up at the adoption hearing and the cases have come to a screeching halt. I will briefly go over two cases later where this has happened. So it is important that all parties are asking the question, of American Indian, Native American affiliation and or heritage. Another barrier to compliance is notification. Notification needs to be inclusive of all and any information regarding tribal affiliation to assist the nation in determining eligibility. It must be correct. Once it is known that the child is possibly enrolled or eligible for enrollment, a, no a notification must be sent as the clock starts to tick for the nations as there are various timeframes under ICWA. Active efforts, or I, or I may say a lack of active efforts hinder compliance and can also hinder a judge's decision of removal or reunification. So it is important to ensure active efforts are happening. Another, oh, excuse me, another barrier is QEW usage. Have QEWs been moved, have, have, have they been used, utilized at the appropriate hearings for removal and terminating parental rights? If not, the case has to go back and redo the hearing again. Placement preferences. Is the child being placed according to the placement preferences under ICWA? What, one of the barriers we have is, as Kendra said before, our recruitment of foster families. So that is also one barrier when we don't have the resources. I'd like to make another disclaimer here. I am not an attorney. So the thoughts and opinions on the two preceding cases are mine and mine alone. So a few years ago, the nation saw an ICWA case come to the spotlight. We know it as the baby Veronica case. And this case is unique in its story as most equal cases are. During the pregnancy, the birth mother decided to put up her infant for adoption without informing the father. She arranged for a private adoption with a South Carolina couple. 
because the mother knew of the father's Cher Cherokee heritage, her attorney contacted Cherokee Nation to determine if the infant was eligible for membership in the tribe, but misspelled the father's name and gave the wrong date of birth. Based upon that information, the Cherokee Nation responded, it could not verify the father's membership. Once it did receive the accurate information, it was later affirmed that the father was a member of the tribe and that Veronica, his newborn daughter, was el eligible for, for membership. So in September 2009, um, Veronica is born and the pre-adoptive family take her, take her home. Early in 2010, the father, Dustin Brown, asserts his parental rights. 2011, November, uh, the South Carolina Family Court judge rules in Brown's favor and the app appellate court agrees. The father then takes Veronica from the pre-adoptive family. Again, this is two years into the case. So this child is two years old. Um, at some point, the, the, uh, the pre-adoptive family then appeal to the South Carolina Supreme Court. Again, this, the court rules uh, for Brown, the father. And so the, the pre-adoptive family um, appealed to the US Supreme Court. The US Supreme Court rules that the adoption was proper and did not intrude on Brown's right and sends it back down to the South Carolina Supreme Court for review. The South Carolina Su Supreme Court then orders the pre-adoptive adoption be finalized. At some point, Brown asked the US Supreme Court to temporarily block, block the transfer, the court declines. Here we see there are many red flags and how notification was not accurate. Would this have changed the outcome of the case? Maybe. Even if the father was not in the picture, but we know his status and placement preferences were not followed. This case was a big motivator to having the ICWA guidelines revised and reissued in 2016. Now we fast forward a few years and we have another ICWA case making headlines. We call it the Brekeen case. In 2017, a Texas couple sought to adopt a child whose biological mother is Navajo and the biological father is Cherokee. In 2018, the federal district court in Texas made a widely criticized decision that held ICWA violates the US constitution. It is important to remember that ICWA is not race-based, but political as a matter of law. The political status of tribes arises from hundreds of years of treaties and agreements among governments. In response to the appeals brought by the federal government and the intervening tribal nations at the time, a three judge panel from the Fifth Circuit reversed that decision, reaffirming the constitutionality of ICWA. But it doesn't quite end the fight. The, Bra the Brackeens push for a rehearing. So in Jan January 2020, a rehearing before the entire judicial panel and the US Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals took place. And now we continue to wait for that opinion. Now, had we followed ICWA from the, from the initiation on both these cases, would they have gotten so far and grabbed national attention? Who knows? Maybe, maybe not. So who is affected by non-compliance? As we've seen on the previous slides, when ICWA is not followed, it affects all, even those who are non-native, such as the pre-adoptive parents. So it is imperative we are asking the appropriate questions in the case initiation and throughout the life of the case but also ensuring recruiting and strategizing to make sure we have the resources to support ICWA. Without it, we see that native children lose the family and tribal connections or lose time with their family and communities. They lose out on those teachings and the language. Native families suffer with the removal of their children, sometimes unnecessarily. Tribal nations suffer by losing the keepers of their traditions and customs. I have seen firsthand what happened to a family when a child is unnecessarily removed from their family and how it affects its future generations. At a time when the government was authorized to remove children from their parents and their communities, my maternal grandmother at the age of three was removed from her father and placed into a residential boarding school. It was here that she remained until she was 16 years old. During her stay, she endured severe abuse, the loss of her language and the absence of a true family. She entered the boarding school, a young speaker of her traditional language, but left with few words. She was brought up in a setting that, that, that did not value, that, that did not see the value and the importance of her language or of her attending traditional ceremonies. As she got older and had her own family, she struggled to regain what she lost. She eventually returned to the longhouse and became a clan mother, a matriarch. But she never regained. Her, 
her full native tongue. She was unable to teach her children or her grandchildren the language of her people. It is thought that our language is an important part of our being, our way of life, and it is essential for our ceremonial survival. My grandmother was a lucky one. She survived and returned to her community, but there were many, many others who did not. I hope you take from my family story how important ICWA and ensuring family and cultural connections are to me. I do not take lightly where I am today in this position. I see it as I was destined to be here because of what she went through. I'm here fighting for those children who don't have voices. I am fighting for my ancestors who lost their voices. So, <laughs> next slide, please. <laughs> Wasn't supposed to cry. <laughs> So in the event of ensuring compliance to avoid unwarranted and messy situations by PICO, if our, if our caseworkers and attorneys of the Department of Social Services follow the practice of the ICWA case pro process checklist regularly, will the number of compliant ICWA cases increase? As the director of the of Native American Services, I generally review anywhere from 200 to 300 cases annually. Each case is one child, even if it is a family of five, as not all children may be equal eligible. Historically, my unit determines compliance by notification and placement. When I look at a case, I look to see if notification was sent out and I review the placement of the child and if it adheres to the placement preferences outlined in the, fed in the fed federal statute. While our compliance numbers are great, but there's always room for improvement, as I was reviewing the data for 2019, I saw that we left out information on compliance for active efforts and qualified expert witness usage. There is no real tool, or I should say, there was no real tool to assist caseworkers in documenting these mandates. So I had to figure out what I was going to do to ensure that not only notification and placement were complied with, but also active efforts in QEW usage. But before I get into that, let's take a look at the data I reviewed. Here is a data that shows the percentage of ICO cases verified of the cases reviewed. So for example, let's take a look at the year 2019. In that year, I reviewed 276 cases with the help of my lovely assistant, Lisa. Um, what we determined were 61 cases were determined to be ICWA. 61 or 22.1%. Of the 61 cases, 59 were kinship placement placements, that's a really great number. 19.7 were Native American foster home placement and 9.8 uh, were placed with non-Native foster homes. And lastly, 11.5 were placements needing a higher level of care such as ther therapeutic foster home or a residential setting. If you take a closer look in at column two, you will see that starting in 2005, that with each preceding year, the kinship placement percentage increase every year. I'd like to think that the increase in compliance rate is due to the follow-up my unit does with caseworkers working on ICWA cases. However, that takes a ton of time and energy. This is another graph that shows the path of the rate of compliance throughout the years. Starting in 2015, we started with 83% in 2016, 67, and 2017, 69%. 2018, 70%, and 2019, 90%. My hope this year is to have a compliance rate of over 90%, even if it is just half a point. So there have been a few toolkits that have been issued in, measuring, in assisting and measuring compliance, and such as the one featured here for the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. Before I took over as director for my unit, they already had developed a desk aid. This desk aid highlights the important pieces of ICWA, as well as gives, gives general information to caseworkers when working with Native families. It is a great tool, but we needed something more. We needed a tool that would highlight the important pieces and assist in tracking. So a checklist was developed. Sherilyn's favorite, a checklist. <laughs> 
So after reviewing the current data points of notification and placement and realizing that we weren't looking at the full compliance picture and being inclusive of active efforts in QEW usage, um, we, while in conversation with caseworkers and the cases and and on the case discussions happens about this hap, happening about eh, excuse me about the steps to compliance there was no official documentation for such steps so the form in the process of so this form is actually in the process of becoming an official agency form and expected to be used with each case this will have the native american service units measure compliance as well as verify it has been documented and with the assistance of my agency's equal legal team and public information office the draft i was created was turned into this wonderful specimen here it looks very more technical than what i drafted and what i drew up <laughs> so this checklist will assist in making sure the caseworker will be fully compliant with ICWA. it asks about each step and provides a space for justification as to why a certain step was not adhered to such as active efforts most importantly is asking about documentation. When, when I, when I, meaning the date, when I am looking or when I am reviewing cases, I look for documentation on notification, placement and active efforts. Sometimes I am reading for days before I can, before I come across a note that discusses placement. The form asks for a date of documentation, which make it easier for reviewers to verify the note. For those cases that have very long histories, um, when you add a date, we can actually go into that date, search that date, and look for the documentation. So it makes it a lot easier. OCFS has a policy, but the checklist will enhance it while assisting with compliance. <sighs> this journey, this journey has been quite, quite amazing and educational for me. Well, coming up with the idea and drafting the tool was the easy part. The journey for approval of a policy or enhancement is the real task. I had to approach my associate commissioner, David Bach, and my and my director of regional operations, Barbara Greenflood, with my idea and sell it. Well, I think they liked it, liked it as they approved. I should mention that both my associate commissioner and director of regional operations have always been very supportive of my work and both look for ways to assist in addressing any of my issues. After their approval, the next step was to get everything drafted. So I had to work with policy to develop a memo to, to issue to the field but they had asked for legal's approval. So off my path, I had to veer a little bit to the right and get their gracing. They did give it after some revisions were added, then back on track to policy. So policy said, great, now draft us something. Well, that exercise we did here in the MPLD was great, but I was shaking in my boots about writing a policy for my agency. I think I stressed out about it for a couple of weeks, came up with some weak ideas, but then I thought, why am I reinventing the wheel? We have a policy, I'm just adding to it. So after admitting that I am far from a policy writer and I now have a newfound appreciation for policy writers, my policy writer, Laura Turner and I decided that we will revise the current administrative directive and we have and add the information on the ICRA case process checklist. This way the field is reminded of ICWA and is informed of the new tool. The checklist has just ended its second round of comment and review period, almost to the finish line, but not quite. I now have to package and to package the product and prepare for approval from both a deputy commissioner and agent, agency commissioner. Once I have their golden stamps, we can implement, fingers crossed. So going through this process had me thinking, maybe we should make this a lean project, but let's not figure that out now. Once I am approved, uh, once this is approved, we will send out as administrative directive to all the local districts. And this field will be reminded of ICWA and be informed of the new checklist we have developed. My hope is that the checklist will be utilized when serving, servicing Native families and children. So when I go to review cases, I will be able to pull this form and see at which stage the case is at and what other steps we may need to happen for us to come to full compliance, if able. I'm also brainstorming on, on, on phases for training on the form and believe a webinar may be vital to ensure the case workers know how to utilize the form and answer any questions they may have on it. While my unit will continue to track ICO cases, the form will allow me to track documentation on active efforts and QEW usage. As calls and emails come in requesting ICWA assistance, my unit will be able to see how many caseworkers are aware of the form and utilizing it. 
As I said before, follow up with caseworkers on the important pieces of ICWA is a lot of work and manpower. My hope is that this checklist will be able to assist the caseworker to be more confident and diligent in documenting and requiring less follow up for my office, allowing us to focus our manpower in other needed areas. The first set of data will be collected once the form has been utilized for one full year. And I am excited to see what that, what that produces. So MPLD impacts. <laughs> When I first heard about this program, I doubted my ability to be, accept, to be selected as Native Americans are rarely ever seen in leadership positions, except for this year, right, Deb Halen? <laughs> but I was certainly surprised when I was selected. The pro, this program and the mentors Arlene and Sherilyn gave me the confidence and skills to forge ahead, built me up in helping me understand my worth, not only as an individual, but also as a professional in child welfare. While I may have doubted myself, there were others that saw what I cannot, and I'm so grateful for those that pushed me to apply. This program has had me look not only as my work as a manager, but also at myself as a leader. And reflecting my core values of compassion, respect, and integrity, all of which are my traditional head and Ashoni teachings, I've come to realize that they also speak to those of a leader. This program has taught me that minorities and Native Americans are important in being seen and heard in the child welfare system. And without them, without us, the work of, equ of equity we strive for would fail. I'd also like to thank my mentor, Rihanna Gonzalez, for taking me on. Oh, how I remember being so nervous writing my email and asking <laughs> for me. Because if you know Rihanna, you know she does not play around. Even, but even with her busy schedule, she didn't hesitate to say yes. While she may not know this, she is someone I hope I make proud and hope to grow up to be like. Thank you for everything. And lastly, I humbly thank the mentors in this program for the knowledge they have bestowed upon me and the skills they have assisted in developing and honing to mold my leadership style. Thank you.